Welcome everyone and thank you for tuning in. I'm Antonie Koning, I'm the gender lead at SIGAV and I'm delighted to be here with um, Mary Allen Iskandarian, uh, the CEO of Women's World Banking. I'm here with her at the European Microfinance Week 2020, a special edition, this virtual, this virtual world. Um, we're focusing here on how the COVID-19 crisis impacts on women. Um, and Mary Ellen, in an interview that you gave a couple of months ago, I remember you said that you consistently ask yourself, why does it take something as shocking and damaging as COVID-19 to actually highlight inequality? And I thought that was a very important question um, to, to raise. And the pandemic has indeed painfully demonstrated the weaknesses of unequal societies and the challenges faced by the most vulnerable. In this session, what we're like, what we're looking at is particularly the impact it has had on uh, poor women. And I wanted to ask you maybe to uh, get us started with an overview of what has been the most critical impact of COVID-19 on women around the world, according to you. Um, well, before I, I turn to that that very distressing topic, let me just say that I'm delighted to be here with you, Antonique, and you know, going to Luxembourg for the European Microfinance <laughs> Forum has always been a highlight of my month of November. So I'm I'm glad that at least virtually I'm able to to join the um, the festivities again. Um, but really, turning to the question that that you raised, you know, as 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 you said, uh, you know, COVID nineteen didn't create disparities, but it really has shown such a bright light on really where some of the fissures are, where some of the biggest gaps are. And, and what we're particularly concerned about with Women's World Banking, at Women's World Banking, is that, you know, things may be made even worse. And so while, you know, we've always known that the face of poverty is a female face, um, there is a real risk of, you know, globally, you know, something like you know, 90 million people, I think, going backwards into extreme poverty. And the the data seems to indicate that over 50% of those will be um, will be women. And very, very concerningly, you know, we've made some tremendous strides in the last uh, several years in terms of particularly primary education and girls' primary education. And uh, we're already starting to see girls being the first to be taken out of school or unable to, to attend school. And we know that that's, you know, girls' education is almost, uh, you know, singularly the most impactful uh, development impact one can, uh, one, one can have. We've seen that women are vastly overrepresented in those employment sectors that have been hardest hit. They, they've been unemployed from the formal sector at a much greater rate. And because we know that women, particularly low income women, are um, overrepresented in the informal sector, they've been also particularly hard hit. Um, you know, for example, you know, just among domestic workers, we've seen, um, you know, 72% of them, I gather, um, uh, have have been uh, put out of a job as a result of uh, the pandemic. So it's, a, it's really a, a question of, um, you know, disparities already existing and being made that much worse. Yeah, very, very much so. As as you said, I mean, this hasn't, this these problems have have really had a basis already of inequality, and and particularly the informal sector that you highlighted, I think, is a is an in, an important part of um, the the economy that we just don't have a good grip on. And therefore, as crises emerge, like we've now seen, um, we're not really well prepared to support um, vulnerable people in that part of the sector. And as you rightly pointed out, in women are, are predominantly represented in those uh, informal sectors. And even in, in you know, safety nets that have been created, uh, it has appeared uh, to be very difficult to to even identify the people that need that support and, and women in the, in particular. Um, besides, of course, the safety nets and the support that has been rallied, um, women and men have used their own coping strategies in this in these very hard times to deal with the crisis. Um, I think we see on average that um, women have um, relied more heavily on 
um, family and friends for money to cope and, and they're less likely to rely on financial institutions to help smooth uh, consumption as far as we can uh, tell from the data that has been ha has been gathered. I wonder how you see the, the, the role that both formal but also informal financial services play at this time for, for women to cope with the um, with the pandemic and and how these coping strategies that women use are different from from men. Can you say a little bit more about that? Um, sure. And and you know, I think this is one of the areas where there, you know, there there may be you know, in some senses, positives and negatives of some of the shifts that we're seeing in the financial inclusion space. Um, you know, as you point out. Um, you know, low-income people as a whole, but but particularly women, you know, cope through a whole variety of different mechanisms. They're they're borrowing from each other. They're saving both in savings groups and in other informal mechanisms. Anything that relies on that in-person close contact as a result of financial, um, you know, for financial services. And that's really where some of the group savings models, um, you know, particularly come to mind, have been have really been decimated by mm. by the, the crisis. Um, any of the microfinance models that, re, you know, require that that center meeting or that group contact um, have, have been really very hard hit. But where I say that there might be a, a silver lining is we've seen a growing number of savings groups now connected to you know digital infrastructure and being able to be tied digitally to the the formal financial sector. So we also know that while women may rely more heavily on on family and friends to support in times of crisis, there's also you know as as I'm sure you've seen um, data that suggests that the digital financial services sort of widen that network of contacts that women can rely on um, as part of their their coping mechanisms. But I also think you know those safety nets that you alluded to provide a real opportunity as well as so many of um, so many uh, un and underbanked women in the world have now been able to open accounts on you know a remote basis which you know even a matter of years ago was you know considered verboten there were all sorts of regulatory reasons why remote account opening just couldn't possibly happen that have somehow been leapfrogged uh, in the moment of crisis. We've seen countries like both India and Peru have uh, COVID response government payment uh, platforms that are explicitly um, sent to women and directed to women. And that has re had a lot of you know, resounding effects in terms of their control of and use of those, um, those emergency funds. So I, I think there's a, the the mechanisms that work for women in an informal setting, you know, the the groups, um, making sure that there's a really clear understanding of how the product works, allowing um, women to ask questions. All of those things can be applied in a digital setting, and so people can stay safe and um, you know, sort of as I say, leapfrog that need for that that interpersonal contact. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good point to make because it really combines both what you're saying is both the, the, the preferences and the choices that women have in terms of how they want to use those informal financial services and what, what draws them to that, as well as highlighting some of the challenges that formal financial services in the past and, and still today, I would say, um, you know, pose some structural problems that really need to be addressed. And I think what you mentioned, this kind of positive um, developments as a result of a crisis, we should really take advantage of that and 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 further further develop that and use those those use cases and examples also to to demonstrate that some progress can be made um, to resolve some of the more structural um, issues. Uh, you've mentioned the savings groups, and I actually wanted to dig a little deeper into the the role of savings in kind of the times of, of, of crisis. And, and you probably know that this year's European Microfinance Award uh, was also on the topic um, of, of savings. Savings generally play an important role in as part of the coping strategy. Um, now, there's still 
a lot of issues to be resolved, um, both on the supply side with business case issues, as well as a trust, I think, um, on, on the other side, on the demand side. But I, I, I know that many of the institutions in your network, in the Women's World Banking um, a group of, of institutions and partners um, have a very strong drive on, on saving. So I, I thought maybe you could give us a little bit of insight from your um, large network in terms of how important savings uh, plays as, as, as um, a coping strategy in dealing with the crisis. I, I was so happy to see that the, the, the microfinance weeks award was on savings that that there wasn't a last minute you know plan to change it because i think that's been one of the i think really important underpinnings and and um in some respects maybe even surprising findings that we've seen during this crisis that in many countries we've seen savings account balances increase um and i i take that to be you know a very good sign in the sense that that people are recognizing and as we know, women tend to be the savers in the household that are, are recognizing the need to build their own safety nets, their need to, um, you know, to, to, to have, have those savings um, kept in place for both resilience and then recovery and then ultimately um, resilience. But I think it also says a, a fascinating thing in that, um, you know, in crises past, we have traditionally seen you know runs on the bank and that people have taken money out of the bank and so i'd like to believe that this does signal perhaps a greater trust a greater sense of um safety uh being associated with keeping one's one's savings in the, in the bank in terms of some of the partners that we're that we're working with um we're working with uh one of the largest private um excuse me public sector banks in india bank of baroda and you know, pre-COVID, we had been working on ways for them to increase activation of the um, the Jandan accounts, financial inclusion accounts in, in that country. And then, you know, when COVID hit, we started discussing with the banks, do we, you know, pivot? Is this still time for a savings um, project? Only to see, as I mentioned earlier, the government's G2P payment come in directed to women. We saw, again, account openings shoot up. We saw the level of activity within those accounts really dramatically increasing. Um, our model with Bank of Baroda had been very much um, based on a, um, a banking correspondent model. And we found as we're seeing in so many places that it was the women banking correspondents that were really making inroads. They were, people, both men and women felt more comfortable asking questions about how the account worked, how the G2P payment worked. Obviously those women uh, banking correspondents literally became frontline workers and became a critical aspect uh, of the delivery of that, um, of of that that payment to the people who need it, need it most. And so we were delighted that, um, Bank of Baroda really went above and beyond providing insurance coverage to those correspondents, making sure that that they had PPE and that they, that they were um, protected in that environment. So I, I, I think that savings is playing a, a crucial role in, in this recovery. One other project I might just allude to is we've been doing um, quite a bit of work in the last couple of years with the Indo Indonesian government's PKH conditional cash transfer program, which is overwhelmingly directed um, to, to low-income women. And in response to COVID, the government um, increased the velocity of payments paid, you know, sort of um, twice a month as opposed to every other month. And again, we were fascinated to see the number of women who were saying, now that I have more money coming in more frequently, is there a way, is there a mechanism that I can save some of this money? And, you know, on the one hand, it pointed out that they didn't really entirely understand that there had been a bank account underlying that payment. So it was a great opportunity, a great learning opportunity to be able to explain the, the payment. But that, you know, that immediate instinct was, can we save with it? And then um, as we often see, a lot of the women say, is there any way my husband could not know that I'm receiving this payment so that I can make sure that it stays in the in the account and 
and helps us as we go forward with this this crisis rather than you know spending it on immediate consumption yeah no these are these are really good examples and i think it really um shows the that that once trust can be can be created and the mechanisms are there um, that are aligned with people's preferences that that also women can actually use these these accounts much more to their own benefit and um, you've touched on a couple of digital examples already um that uh Digit, in a way that digital innovation can actually help overcome some of the challenges. I mean, the example you just gave in terms of the question that the women ask about their mum, their, their men not, uh, you know, their husbands not being able to to know about it. Obviously, these issues are related to to privacy and and uh, some of the underlying social norms about managing um, financial services and managing accounts, etc., uh, play per, play a role in that. So I think there there is certainly um, room for for further exploration and improvement using digital innovations to um, to to um, further advantage uh, women using financial services and, and really empowering them in this in this context um, so I, I think there's there's good opportunities there but one thing that I wanted to um, actually ask you also is about some of the challenges. I know that Women's World Banking has just put out a paper where you um, really refer to the digital innovation and also some of the fintechs are the future of finance and can really, when used well and when designed and delivered in an appropriate may, way, um, support women in, in their economic empowerment. Um, but we also know that there are still some challenges out there and digital innovation isn't the, the kind of miracle solution that we're all <laughs> hoping to get. But we need to be aware of, of some of the, the kind of um, potential um, risks that are out there as well. So I wondered if you could just uh, highlight um, a, a little bit what are these things that we should be um, concerned about, anticipate and react uh, to um, when it comes to digital innovation supporting women? Um, mm -hmm. what, what are some of those risks? Well, I think the one thing that we just have to always remember right up front is that Yes, you know, digital financial services delivered through um, cell phone technology, it really is a miracle to, to a great extent. And it has allowed us to, um, to deliver financial services to people that we never dreamed we would be able to at, at a lower cost, a level of convenience um, that, again, never, never before imagined. But 300 million women don't own cell phones. Um, it's it, it, if you don't have access to the technology, you just don't have access to all of that that opportunity. And that's just sort of the the gross number that there are 300 million fewer phones in the hands of women. The gap is even greater when we talk about mobile internet and you know access to the smartphone, which it really is the mechanism through which digital financial services are, are really moving at such a rapid pace. So that just the, that fundamental understanding of a lack of the technology in women's hands is so critical. We also know that, you know, on that, that customer journey, the, the biggest gender gap is in that initial uptake period. So even if they manage to get the technology, then that sense of you know digital literacy, financial literacy, women experience to a much greater extent um, than men do. So I think we really, you know, this industry um, has gone through such a uh, its own journey, really, on the issues of digital and financial literacy. You know, back in in the old days, it was assumed to be part of the the packaging, and then as more and more of the financial inclusion world started talking about, um, you know, commercialization and making sure that that the industry was sustainable, you know, issues of literacy became much more sort of nice to have and add-ons, and they were often the first thing that was let go when a product was being made more sustainable. And I really think we've got to come full circle because these products won't be taken up. We won't be able to achieve all that's possible if we don't find ways to build in digital financial capability training. And through the product itself, through the channel, it doesn't have to be this, 
expensive. And in fact, we we know from from this long history of of literacy training that you know the old classroom model is the least effective way yeah. to communicate. And so I, I think we've all got to you know sort of take that burden back on and recognize it not as a burden but as an opportunity. Um, to to make sure that the the real that that miracle that real opportunity that sits with digital financial services can be enjoyed by men and women alike. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really important uh, message. I think for the for the industry, I, I'm wondering, you know, as Women's World Banking, you have a large network. It also has been completely diversified. I think over the last couple of years, and I wonder how you see your role as as the network. Um, you know, reflecting the, the the realities of women clients, um, as well as the challenges that are faced by the institutions serving them, um, to to funders and governments, and and the, the role that you play, um, as well as how you engage with other um, actors in the financial inclusion space that are working on uh, women's economic empowerment. Um, how do you engage? How do you make sure that you um, together reinforce the efforts and 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 really. Um, move the, the the sector in taking these issues into into account. I, I I'd love to hear about that. Well, you know, we we at Women's World Banking. I mean, I think we have a have a, a history and um, you know a, a a tradition of really seeing everything through that gender lens. That we start from the position of. Uh, Yes, equality of access to financial services, but to what end? And that for us is always about the empowerment of the woman in that in that that greater sense. So it's not just you know counting the numbers of women with accounts, but what does that that account um, accomplish? And so I think our role of shining that bright light. Um, both to financial service providers and and what's been very exciting to us in the last few years is um, we've adopted a um, customer lifetime value model for a lot of the um, the product uh, rollouts that we've um, we've been doing with individual you know banks and cell phone companies and uh, fast moving consumer goods companies and just really seeing that there is a a genuine commercial opportunity to uh, financing that that woman customer long term they tend to be you know lower cost to acquire and then over that lifetime value they tend to be more loyal and and genuinely um, profitable customers even if the transaction size both in terms of savings deposits or the size of loan um, is smaller if you look at the lifetime value of that customer um, she's really she's really worth making that investment and so I think being able to prove that commercial business case has really increased our um, you know the number of allies that we have alongside us we've also in the last few years gotten much more deeply engaged in um, in working with the regulator community, who, you know, in many countries have set very ambitious, very exciting goals for financial inclusion and adopted national financial inclusion strategies. We saw repeatedly from the FINDEX data that it was those countries that set targets that actually made the biggest, biggest um achievements. But then we were consistently seeing them falling short. And the difference by which they were falling short was almost always attributable to an inability to reach women and to really move that gap, which seemed so unbudgeable, uh, that gender gap uh, in reaching women. And so the the regulatory community, I think, is really taking uh, diversity within their own ranks seriously, recognizing that there is, a, you know, a very very. Um, uh, very large gender gap in terms of who regulators are and, and the makeup of regulatory bodies and recognizing that having more of a diverse um, set of skills and perspectives around that regulatory table can be part of the um, the answer to, 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 closing, to closing that gap. Um, and I'd say one of the things that we are most keenly aware of um, and are are trying to rally as many um, partners in in banging this drum is the need for gender disaggregated data, uh, and it's stunning to me that you know 
in 2020, we're still talking about something that's been on, you know, the G20 agenda, and it's been something we've been talking about now for, you know, well over a decade. But I think we're finally seeing, um, you know, even something you mentioned earlier about um, identifying, you know, where those problems exist. You. If you don't know who your customers are, if you don't know what gender they are, how are you going to try to address a, a problem or take advantage of an opportunity? And I think we're finally seeing both from the side of financial service providers and regulators a real interest in understanding that data. Great. Now, I, I think you're, you hit on some key points that, that help to 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 rally uh, different uh, stakeholders um, around the cause and and there is more and more data that demonstrates that if you do so um, both on the financial service providers as well as regulators you're you're better off um, and there's of course a large community uh, out there of of organizations that that are all rallying behind that same uh, same motto I mean one of the things that I was wondering about is where you get your inspiration and learning from as a as a network I, I imagine you have a strong influence uh, with your uh, partners, but also I think Women's World Banking plays an important role in the industry. And then I'm thinking more about um, actors that are um, trying to achieve the same objective as as you are. Um, so I don't know if that is something that that you see indeed. As 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 you mentioned, you have been with this goal for a long time already. But there's many other actors that are also um, uh, coming into this space or have been in the space for so long. And I think a lot of the coordination and convergence is happening now. And maybe the crisis also kind of puts a spotlight on that. I don't know what you think about that. Oh, absolutely, Antonique. And I, and I think, you know, Finequity is right at the top of, of that list. I mean, I think one of the things that's ex exciting about the crisis or, you know, that this, this concept of, you know, not letting the crisis go to waste yeah. is that as we bring more people into the into the tent focused on on diversity they bring the strengths and and the 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 knowledge and and all that they've been been doing in their in their world prior to joining the cause of of gender equality and so you know for example we've recently started working um, very closely with our uh, our regulatory uh, work with the IMF, and you know to think about the bringing the macroeconomic power and research chops of the IMF, you know, to this table has been you know really extraordinary, and that they're able to say things that we've always kind of suspected about you know, diversity and what the impact on financial inclusion and financial stability is, but like like I'm sure you're seeing at, at Finequity, having, you know, researchers and uh, practitioners who may have been tangentially engaged in, in gender equality, now bringing the full, you know, power of their, um, of their resources to that is really, really exciting. Yeah, no, I think this is a, that's a, a good a good point maybe to end on uh, for this uh, this conversation. It's been it's been really great talking to you, Mary Ellen. I think if I'm taking away a couple of key points, you've highlighted the importance of data, and and knowing what the problem is and understanding uh, the, the the needs, uh, especially for women clients. I think we've talked about technology and how digital innovation can indeed. Um, help and there is some silver lining maybe even in this crisis but we need to use it well and we need to make sure that we are uh, aware of some of the challenges um, surrounding the use of, of uh, digital solutions that uh, still many um, especially women are facing and we concluded I think on the note of coordination and leveraging industry knowledge um, to come up with better solutions and all rally behind the cause of uh, supporting women's economic empowerment. So with that, I think we uh, conclude a, a, a nice conversation. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. And uh, I wish you a good European Microfinance Week. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Antony. Great being with you.